welcome, welcome to the Transitional Justice and Memorialization um, panel, Architecture, Memory and Truth with Sergio Beltran and Robin Greeley. And um, I want to very quickly introduce the two main speakers um, first, but before that, thank the Human Rights Institute for co-sponsoring this the Art and Art History Department also for co-sponsoring and El Instituto for being also a co-sponsor and a real supporter. And also thank you very much to Alyssa Webb who has been really uh, generous with her time and expertise. So um, very quickly, Sergio Beltran um, is an, ar an architect and an activist and researcher who engages um, with the aesthetic and political practices of truth um, elucidation, uh, sorry, non and non-repetition in human rights, for the human rights viols, violations by using memory um, as a point of entry. He's a researcher with uh, a group called Forensic Architecture and works very closely with victims of human rights violations, um, their advocates, their lawyers and communities to develop radical and innovative memorials which open rather than foreclose avenues of transformative justice. Robin Greeley, on the other hand, is a, a professor of art and art history, a press, sorry, professor of art history in our department, Department of Art and Art History. She specializes in modern and contemporary art, especially in Mexico, and she's published um, tons of articles uh, very widely on the, on the topic of contemporary art and, and modern. She's also a founding member of the Symbolic Reparations Research Project, which um, very much corresponds to uh, Sergio's work on reparations, memorialization, and transitional justice. So thank you very much, you guys, for, uh, for everything. <laughs> Okay, um, um, maybe Michael, you wanna turn your microphone off um, and we'll get going um, here. So uh, thank you for that introduction. And we're here to speak with, um, with Sergio on his work. And what I wanna do um, is uh, first sort of set out a little bit of, a, a get, get Sergio to talk a little bit about um, how he got into this whole business of memorialization. And then I want us to talk a little bit about some of the theoretical concerns um, that he, that Sergio, you're, you're um, um, approaching uh, to give us a kind of framework for the, for the discussion um, before going into some detail about specific cases that you've been working on. And so the format here is, um, uh, I've, I've put a little note to, to everyone in the, the chat function uh, so when we when we get to the end of the discussion, we will open up the uh, chat uh, function for question and answers, and try to get as many uh, you know as much of a conversation with um, you people out there in the public as possible. Um, so um, so let's start off, Sergio, if you don't mind, um, talking a little bit about um, how you began working on this as an architect on this issue of memorialization in particular. Thanks, Robin. And thanks, Michael, for that generous introduction. Um, well, my story with architecture really begins when, I was, when I'm a child. Um, I guess from a very early age, I was very aware of the deep inequalities um, growing up in Mexico City, both of people who are much, much wealthier and much, much poorer than, than I am. and. I sometimes explain this, this stumbling into architecture as a process where on one side of my family, there was a deep um, vein of engineering and public works. So I was very interested in, in exploring building um, you know, for the government and for the people, so to speak, for the public. And on the other hand, on the other side of my family, there's a, um, a tradition or uh, the business is selling art. So I was exposed to art from a very, very early age. And as I came to age, I, uh, one day I found myself thinking about, well, will I become an artist or will I become a civil engineer? 
And a friend uh, suggested that I study architecture. And I thought that was quite a boring proposal because I thought of architecture strictly in terms of business, of development, of these, um, maybe in its more social dimensions as a more like um, social housing, like 60s, 70s sort of conception. Uh, but one day, uh, I, as fate would have it, I went to Berlin in 2006. I had barely, barely uh, turned 18. And I stumbled upon this, this memorial. And I'll be intermittently sharing my screen um, on and off. But I walked into this space in Berlin called the New Guard, Die Neue Wache. And for the first time in my life, I felt space move me as, as though a song or, or, or a narration, a film, a, a book would. And I realized that architecture actually had the power to, to convey uh, strong emotions, to convey histories, to convey narratives. And I decided to, to I, little did I know that in 2006, I actually, a little seed of obsession with memorials was planted in me that would take years to, to sprout and, and actually grow into what is my, my research and my career to this day. So what I did was uh, go into architecture school and I was very uh, disenchanted because I did not really find any um, the social uh, dimension or political dimension. I would later find out that this was actually not a social dimension, but a political dimension to architecture. Uh, when I studied at the National Autonomous University of Mexico from 20, 2007 to 2013. And as that happened, the, um, the war on drugs in Mexico, which began in 2006, um, it started becoming from a very ignored and, and uh, under the water narrative. And as I kept studying architecture, it became more and more prominent. So what I'm showing here is like a very uh, flattened uh, view of history and of understanding the violences that I had seen as a child, uh, how they became expressed through uh, very, very uh, kinetic violences or, or expressions of violence that are, uh, well, very graphic, such as forced disappearances, murders, and, uh, and dispossessions of land. So what I did was to try to, to think about what my role could be as a person, as a Mexican growing up in this, in this conflict and, and living through this conflict, uh, surviving this conflict and seeing how other, other communities of disciplines started, uh, I would say maybe not waking up, but sensitize, becoming sensible to this, to this context of violence. And I mean, I would see the victims but not only victims, like I would see, uh, you know, the families of victims, I would see lawyers, journalists, artists, I would see so many people trying to, to find a way to contribute to a pacifying process to stop this violence that even till this day, uh, more than 15 years after the conflict began, how to actually uh, participate and, and try to pacify. And what I asked myself was, well, what is the role of an architect here? Oh, and, and I even dared to ask, and, and to this day, I ask myself, like, can architectural design architects mitigate, even, even dare to, to prevent violence from happening? So that is what, what really got me into this line of work. And I found two general paths to, to answer this question. One is through memory and memorials, and the other one is through work in forensics. So I'd say, Robin, that it was accidental, but on hindsight, connecting the dots backwards, um, it's kind of, it kind of really feels like a progression in which I've been trying to think as a designer and as an architect and as a person that is sensible to violence and inequality, how we can see these as design problems and how as a designer, I can respond with a design answer. No? Good. Um, I, I, I see this as a, a really interesting trajectory in, in that um, the, the, the field of architecture seems at first not to have, have given you a, 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 a notion of the political, um, of its address to the, to the political. Um, but I also see you really interested in the relationship between architecture and the public sphere architecture and what you see as a, what you saw as the rise in violence um, um, in, in Mexico uh, around the war on drugs and that this really pushed you forward to conceptualizing more carefully um, not only architecture but also um, you know how, how to take that into some kind of real um, 
real um, public service, <laughs> um, maybe you could say. I guess, I mean, one of the things that was really crucial to, to, to find a, a, a string which I could pull and unravel, and I'm, that I'm still unraveling today, and I'm sure I will be unraveling for, for a long, long time, was uh, to find a grounding in theory. Um, I, it's actually been 10 years since I started protesting and became an activist. And it was, um, I began to, to I, I've discovered myself as an activist in spring of 2011. As the Arab Spring was was you know moving a lot of, of, of ideas about what the internet could mean and um, you know it's, it was a very different world ten years ago and I and I kept looking back at Mexico while I was living in Berlin you know I was surrounded by all of these memorials and that you know commemorated wars to decades past and I was just thinking about well eventually in Mexico we're going to have to to build our own memorials to this war back then that war wasn't part of the public narrative now it is. Um, and what I thought was, well, what kind of memorials are we going to build? Are they going to be inspired on the memorials that I'm seeing in Berlin right now? And from the very start, I had the intuition that there was something extremely different about the memorials that I was witnessing and, and, and seeing in Berlin and in, in other parts of Eastern Europe, because I, I traveled a lot during those months in 2010 and 2011 and, and seeing memorials to, to the former uh, Yugoslavia to, to the conflicts in, in, in Serbia and in many different places in Poland as well. And I said, well, all of these memorials, and I thought all of these memorials are to um, conflicts that perhaps aren't so far back in the past, but definitely are, are thought of as uh, consumed, as, as uh, you know, they, they are not on ongoing conflicts anymore. Mm -hmm. what, one could actually argue that they're, they're still ongoing conflicts, right? And what I and that was important because what I thought of in the case of Mexico was well, wait. So are we going to wait until the conflict is over before we start memorializing? And then this rather interesting question surfaced that was like, well, can we create memorials that stop, that can stop ongoing violence? Like, is that even possible? And that's what led me to actually reading into memory, mm -hmm. and and taking critical texts from memory studies. And, and reading them as a designer, thinking always, okay, so how can I read this theoretical uh, text or this, this, these statements and apply them into a design theory that can actually become a space that I can design and build? And that's pretty much how my, my, my entire uh, research began you know, 10 years ago. So, and I Sorry, just um, you're, you're making me think of a, of, of a couple of things. Um, um, one is that um, this, I, th I think there are lots of, of um, situations in, certainly in Latin America, but throughout the world where there is ongoing violence, where societies are not at all um, 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 through a transitional period out of violence. Um, and the question of how to address contexts where uh, violence is still ongoing rather than something in the past is a, a, a really crucial one. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in that with regard to how your, um, how your, how you understood yourself um, looking, living in Berlin, but thinking of other contexts, particularly Mexico, where there's a real temporal difference maybe in, in, in how we're approaching what, which violence is, what histories of violence. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I still think about that too. Um, I mean, I would say that my current answer to, to thinking about those tensions, temporal tensions, is first really, a, I, I eventually stopped thinking about violence in the past as past. You know? uh, but like even those memorials that are, you know, when we, we think about memorials and those first images that come to mind, again, like quintessential, so to speak, or canonical memorials such as 9-11 or to the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin, a Vietnam Memorial and such. Uh, what really started, what really helped me think about how to, to translate those contexts, those temporal and spatial contexts to my own understanding of the Mexican context uh, was really thinking that those ongoing violences went much deeper. That the, the memorials that are canonical commemorate specific moments and spaces in which that those undergo undercurrents of violence explode and become visible and impossible to ignore 
and therefore claim the lives, unfortunately, of, of people that we can name uh, in, in spaces that we can name. But what is underneath those expressions of violence uh, could be argued to pervade, even in, in spaces like uh, the ones that I described. You know, in, in Germany, there, is, there are still undercurrents that are heavily discriminatory and violent towards people that ascribe to, to minorities. Uh, in the United States, one could argue that the 9-11 memorial was also a, had undercurrents of, of misunderstandings between different cultures and so on, no? and Vietnam even. And those, those are very general, those might sound like very general undercurrents of violence, but they are in fact what I see in Mexico and that's what allowed me to translate them. No? And power differentials uh, between genders, between uh, different uh, or you know, Native uh, Americans and uh, you know, people that had a more neoliberal globalized agenda, um, you know, gender as well and, and so on. And what I think when, when I really started working with memorials in Mexico, actually, like one thing I have to say is that when I came back to Mexico City in 2011, I did not know how fast memorials would start being built in, in Mexico. It actually, like that year was, was the first time that memorials to, to tragedies or massacres uh, began to be built both by the by government or state le uh, organizations as well as civilians and victims and and what i would see was a, a state narrative being formed and trying to control narrative and political damage and a legitimate claim by victims that tried to focus on those undercurrents of violence because what they fundamentally wanted was not for their own tragedies to be remembered but for the violence to stop and that's where i wanted to focus on on memorials that not just commemorate, but actually mitigate the, the risk of violence to be prevented. And that's kind of what led me to, to a more serious study of human rights theory and transitional justice. No? Yeah. Yeah. So um, if, we, if we talk about um, your move to a, a, you know, into trying to theorize this, this whole situation, um, I mean, I'm actually reminded of the way in which transitional justice as a concept itself came about. I mean, it, 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 it was a concept that was actually sort of in practice in places like Argentina and Chile um, before it was conceptualized in the 1990s as a you know, sort of theoretical framework that was taken up by the United Nations, et cetera. Um, um, and um, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, good to sort of go through a bit um, what we mean by transitional justice um, and uh, to sort of take apart perhaps some of some of the 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 pillars the the sort of four main pillars and the new fifth pillar of of transitional justice um, here I don't know if you want to do that um, talk about that for a while um, or, sure. yeah okay yeah, yeah for sure I mean so let's to me Huh? I just say, let's try and get, uh, have a definition of transitional justice here, a, a working definition. I, I mean, I, I guess, well, it's very important to think about what a definition for transitional justice is. And I mean, from what I've read, even, even it is mostly juridical scholars who, who try to define and rework transitional justice. And I guess if I would have to answer the question, one of the things that, uh, that I would say when asked how to define your transitional justice, it's that it is a definition in transition. No, that's the very spirit of, of transitional justice is that it is not a, something that a, is set or has a fixed nature, but has to, to adapt um, very, to the very specific contexts and in plural, I say contexts of, of the places where, where these ideas are, are said to be put into action. And, um, so, I mean, you're right, like, I mean, transitional justice is informed by, by processes in, in Chile and Argentina, uh, post-dictator, um, you know, contexts where, where democracies were, were attempting to reestablish uh, themselves uh, in, in a nation building project. Uh, reconciliation is a very important term. These, uh, in turn, were informed by certain processes uh, in post-World War II, such as the Nuremberg trials and, and in Japan. And these processes were, um, you know, there was a there was a, almost a global effort, a community 
a global community in an effort of trying to reintegrate and reconcile with these nations that had perpetrated such such heinous crimes. Um, and it's true, like it was in the 90s until until we had mechanisms such as the ICTY for Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, um, even the, the post apartheid uh, process. These, these all responded to the idea of transitional justice in terms of how can we transition from an authoritarian uh, context where people's rights were infringed, where lives were taken, uh, where the institutions became so debilitated or co-opted by power that they might not work uh, any longer to be able to, to help us out of this context of violence. And that's what tra where transitional comes from. Um, we create transitions from towards something else, right? And, and the notion of justice is also a bit misleading, I think, because transitional justice really isn't ju only about uh, the courts or the spaces of law where, uh, where these actions of indicting those responsible for atrocities you know, are, are processed, but it also has to do with the change of culture. And that's, that's where my work as an architect who, who focuses on memory and memorials really finds a, a space. And I want to respond also to your, your mention of the, of, the, of the pillars, because um, to those of us who aren't uh, uh, familiar, but last year, uh, the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on, on Transitional Justice, he, he um, recalled that we have four it's been accepted for a number of years now that transitional justice has four pillars and any transitional justice mechanism must include these four and they are the seeking of truth finding out what happened in the past and using mobilizing that notion those notions of truth into juridical forums to be able to procure justice and avoid those responsible for perpetrating crimes to be left uh, you know, to impugn uh, or without any punishment and then there are uh, these uh, second, these other two pillars, which are about what comes after. You know? Part of it has to do with reparational processes, which means we need to repair to the damage to not just the victims who directly uh, were affected by violence in terms of the murder of their family members and such, but also collective efforts of, of reparation that could um, sew back together again uh, the, the, the sutures or, the, or the, the wounds of a community fabric, the social fabric that were torn apart and that you know, uh, caused the violence to get to exacerbate. And the fourth one, which I find extremely important for, for the memorialization processes, it's about non-repetition. Um, I think too often we build memorials only to remember, but we don't strive strong enough to, to create spaces of memory that at their heart also works so that, that actions of non-repetition are facilitated and created. And this means if we're remembering uh, the, the violent discrimination of a certain group of the population uh, and, the, and the names of people who we may or not inscribe on a wall, how can we also uh, abstract a little bit that event and understand how those, again, undercurrents of, of discrimination prevail to this day, and how can we make them surface uh, in, in our common uh, knowledge or, or, or in, in our day-to-day -day lives so that our awareness can day-to-day -day act as, as, as ways to re prevent this violence from ever flaring up again. And what, as you mentioned, there, uh, last year's uh, special rapporteur on transitional justice, he, he defined the fifth pillar, which is memory. And rather than placing a, a pillar on the side, he actually uh, develops and argues that memory is, the, is, a, trans, is um, a pillar that crosses and that is transversal. You know? And one thing that I really want to, I mean, I would like to add to this, Robin, is that not only does the special rapper to recognize memory as something central to be able to create, uh, to facilitate the other pillars, but also it, uh, this notion of memory as a weapon that can actually undermine efforts of transitional justice surfaces as well. And, and I mean, the, the, the arguments of how we, we came to see memory as a right, um, you know, there, are, there might be, there's a lot of details in terms of its history. Come, they, they begin, some argue that they begin with, uh, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 under Article 19 and the right to information. 
and how we all have a duty to remember and that remembering necessi necessarily takes us to preventing evil from happening again. But we've seen, uh, I guess by 2020, we can all think of memorials that have been there for decades, but they, they, that they show us that remembering is not enough, that we need to act uh, today in order to, to really achieve those pillars of, of reparation, non-repetition, justice, and truth. So, so yeah, like uh, what, I, what I want to focus on is, is my current research, I guess, what I want to mention is that I've seen how memory has also become a weapon. And this is what the special rapporteur surfaces in his report is that state governments have become, have always been aware of the power of history and memory in order to shape their, their political agendas. But in 2021, in a, in a context where we have access to uh, narrative building technologies, you know, social media and such, uh, the, this, the possibility, just as we have fake news, we also have the potential for fake memory to be widespread. And these, these fake memories might, uh, more often than not have the potential to also create violence. So memory as a weapon is also something that I look out a lot for, is how can we create memorials that are aware of their potential for violence and therefore work so that they, they themselves don't become uh, an accessory of, of, of further violence and thus being able to do, to satisfy the guarantees of non-repetition. Of non um, and there's a couple in blue here on this slide of, of, of directions that I, that I've kind of thought of and I've tried to practice in, in my projects. So, um, so I think uh, this, this diving into the whole concept and practice of transitional justice has really been influential for you um, as has that um, recognition that there is now under, uh, an underway effort to um, conceptualize memory um, as something that transversely runs across all aspects of, of transitional justice and is sort of one of the ways in which um, not only can these various pillars of transitional justice be tied together so that they're not, I mean, I think there's, a, there's often a tendency, especially with states, uh, nation states to, to sort of think that those pillars uh, are, are uh, you know, justice, truth seeking reparation and guarantees of non-repetition are sort of a menu um, out of which you can pick one or the other, you know, but um, that's not the concept at all, that it's a holistic concept um, that means to integrate all of those components and that indeed um, memory is uh, one of the ways in which that integration um, happens so that we're not talking just about, for instance, a, a, a judicial or a normative criminal prosecution um, but we're, we're looking uh, in, in terms of, of um, you know, processes of justice, but rather we're looking at a sort of multivalent um, plurality of measures um, uh, that can give us some kind of broader understanding of redress to, to violence. Um, uh, but you're also raising the really tricky question of, well, memory, it's a nice thought, um, um, but um, it can, as you say, be weaponized um, in, in, um, in, in effect, um, working against this idea of bringing society together um, towards a building a democratic, inclusive, peaceful society. Uh, so I, I, I find that um, really a tough problem and one that um, you address really interestingly in, in, your, in your work. Um, so, um, you know, let's, I don't know where you've got, what, what your next thoughts are, but um, um, perhaps we can um, think about how you contextualize these um, theoretical procedures in your, in your work itself. Yeah, and I would, I would, First, begin responding, Robin. But like, um, I mean, there's, there's the second blue bullet that's here that I'm showing here about multi-directional and non-competitive memory. For me, has been a, a game changer. It comes from Michael Rothbard's uh, book, Multi-directional Memory, which I recommend uh, a lot because it, 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 to me, what it does, 
very effectively is that it uh, makes a diagnosis of how memory has been conceived to be a sort of zero sum game, whereby when one narrates one, a memory, there's this conception that that memory that is narrated uh, invisibilizes and negates the other memories that uh, you know, might, might coexist or be in conflict with this narrated memory. And what Rothberg argues is that memory really shouldn't be thought of as, as realistic, so to speak. And it's a very architectural term, no? as thinking of space, and that one memory uh, that occupies a space cannot be occupied by other memories, but rather we need to think of memory as multi-directional, as multi-perspective, uh, that uh, memories actually have all the potential to complement each other and to give us a, a wider understanding of, of truth might allow us to think better in terms of uh, the other uh, pillars of, of transitional justice, how to repair better, how to focus our, our resources that are always limited. So to move towards uh, answering your question of how do I contextualize to Mexico these ideas, I do want to show uh, a couple of, of slides because one thing that I, I've, I found productive uh, in my research is to, um, as an exercise, hold monuments and memorials as an opposition. Um, um, I, by no means do I, I, I try to say that these, these are black and white, but they, they, they help me trace a spectrum that allows me to place uh, design decisions on one end or the other. When I'm working with uh, government institutions for or against them, uh, they, they do really help me uh, to think about them. And essentially, what, what in a nutshell, what I see as a memorial is as a design or an action that opens up space. You know, it creates space for memory to thrive. Uh, and understanding memory as that which is uh, constantly changing, our, under, our understanding of our past, present, and, and future temporalities is constantly changing. And in, in opposition, the monument can be conceived as something that occupies space. You know? And so going back to that, to Rothberg's term on, on monument, we have a privileging of, of competitive memory, you know, and actually more of history, of official histories that negate any other possibility of interpreting the past, whereas memorials actually open them up. What I found is that we actually need a little bit of both. And I'll explain, for example, in this, in, in this first example, which is the News Divine Memorial. Um, I, I've, I've worked in over 11 uh, different projects at this point uh, in my life, but I want to talk about two to answer your question. This first uh, memorial actually, uh, oh, sorry, um, trigger warning to, to uh, our audience. Um, I guess I'll skip the next slide, but basically the News Divine Memorial is an event in 2008 where a um, criminalized and disenfranchised group of youth in the peripheries of Mexico City uh, were deemed dangerous enough to have their, their community uh, raided by police. And it was so poorly planned. I mean, I guess it's a universal thing that justice for the rich is not the same as justice for the poor. And these people being uh, disenfranchised and marginalized, they, they, they were, uh, the raid that they were attacked with was not planned. And because it was so poorly planned, it created a bottleneck where 12 people asphyxiated. And uh, this, this event basically, they, I mean, to oversimplify the design problem that I was, I was faced with when, when creating this memorial. And it's important to say that I was invited by the families of, of the youth that, that um, were killed that day in 2008 to accompany them and, and advise them. And eventually they asked me to, to design the project for them. So what we see here is trying to, to tear down these very fixed notions in of time in terms that there's something in the past or something in the present and something in the future and rather starting to put them all together. So in this specific design problem, we have to commemorate the murder of 12 victims you know, during a, pol a police raid in 2008. But upon uh, talking to the families of the victims and the communities where they live, we realize that that youth is still exposed to, to the same violence. And, it would, and it's probably just a matter of time before the conditions uh, arrive, sort of like, um, you know, this keg of powder uh, is sparked by an event and it explodes into violence again. So what we need to do is recognize that there's a latent uh, violence that is just waiting for conditions to, to arrive in order to become again a tragedy. 
and work from there. This memorial cannot just think about the past, but it needs to speak to those who are alive today, who are still experiencing that violence before it becomes an acting, providing, in this case, providing educational and cultural uh, tools and, and education to that youth so that when they are faced by this violence, they have better, um, better knowledge, better tools to be able to address and, and mitigate uh, the effect of those violences on their lives. And that's what the, the premise with which we created the memorial. Now, it's important to say that more and more uh, we are understanding that this is a picture of, of one of, of the many interinstitutional, um, wait, let me take a step back. Uh, in order to start designing this memorial, we convinced the Mexico City government to hold twice a week, a three hour uh, space where the victims of the families the families of the victims and many institutions of the local government could talk and have a dialogue and design together the memorial. And this was unheard of in Mexico. Um, it, it, it was a process where we very slowly decided what did a never again mean? How could we uh, make decisions that involve uh, public policy, that involve public uh, resources, money, and architecture to be able to create a space that actually empowers the youth who are still exposed to this violence to, to, to face it better. And what we did is that slowly during the nine months that these, these uh, spaces or these dialogues happened, uh, the, the, the parents of, of those who were, of the youth that were murdered became the advocates of, of their uh, memorial and they presented it to their own community. So this is one of the, the mothers of, uh, uh, of the victims presenting this to the model, the architectural model uh, to the community. And, this is how we slowly uh, build the news divine memorial. And I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm taking too long to answer your question, um, but I mean, I really don't focus so much on the architectural aesthetics, uh, but I will say that rather than, than demolishing and discarding the material of the, the, the place where the police raided these youth, we dismantled it carefully and used the materials to create a new space. So in a way we, we very quite literally took the past and used the material of the past to create space for the present and the future, architecturally speaking. But what's most important for me in, for the memorial are these images. And these are the flyers. I mean, a designer will say like these, these flyers have no design qualities. There's like five different fonts in each flyer. They're, they're ugly, whatever. But these are made by the community themselves who, who, who you know, program and hold activities in the News Divine Memorial that speak to the youth. So, I mean, in one of these flyers, you will see that there is a, a photographic ex exhibition of mothers who are looking for their disappeared children. Or in another, you will see that there's a mother who, whose daughter was, was killed in, in a femicide, speaking to youth. But there will all, and these sorts of testimonies of violence and, and of sharing experiences on violence, they, they live together with hip hop battles or with uh, you know, movie nights or with uh, theater workshops. And that space is what actually is the memorial. And to finish this one example, one day, one of the mothers called me and said, Sergio, they just graffiti the walls of the memorial. I'm so sad. And, and she was like very upset. And I asked her, well, are the, are the activities inside of the memorial still happening? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah they're still happening. And I'm like, okay, fine. The memorial aren't, isn't the walls. The memorial is the people who are in there. And I think that's, that's something that I really stress a lot when I work is I don't really care much for what enables the space so long as people are actually inhabiting that space of memory and connecting the past to their own lives in such a way that in the near future or far future, they can respond better to violence when faced with it. So I'm, I'm really struck by, by a couple of things in your, the way you're describing this. The first is this idea of the processes activated by people um, um, as the central component of what makes what makes a memorial, um, and um, so I think that would be that would be really interesting to to talk further about this this emphasis not so much on a thing as on processes, you know, um, because I think so often with these memorials as you showed in the previous graphic of monument versus memorial 
um, the, the, there's this real tendency, certainly we've found that in the symbolic reparations research project, there's this real tendency to, of, of, for everybody to, to focus on an object and say, okay, there it is, that's it. That's the thing, you know, and this is gonna solve everything. But what we, what we really see actually makes a difference it, are those processes of it, especially involving and foregrounding um, the victims and their families, right? So, so this is, um, these are two things that I really see coming forward in the news divine memorial, that emphasis on processes and that positioning of victims as the, the real advocates, the people who are out there um, um, putting forward their views. And I think this is certainly in Mexico uh, and, and in a lot of places really not the general understanding of how memorials function or how monuments ought to function. So I guess I would like to answer this with two two answers. One is a quick one on 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 victims, no? Um, <clears throat> because I I think too often people uh, or or those of I mean those of us working in, in the human rights world or or those of us who view I mean, I'm not sure if this is a generalized perception, but I think there is a perception where that too often flattens victims into a single category. Um, and I mean, in my experience, I've worked with a, a huge diversity of, of, of victims, some of whom even refuse to be called victims, no? and they rather, they, they ascribe better to, um, you know, terms such as uh, the people affected by violence. You know? um, and, and, you know, really strength, uh, highlighting that it is a, con a temporary condition uh, uh, which one can uh, rehabilitate out of. You know? So that's that's one thing that I, I do want to say because I'm, I've seen, um, I've worked with victims who are very much uh, thinking about their memorial processes as monuments in this in this opposition that I that I propose. And some of them are actually amazingly uh, in tune with the, memor the memorial. Um, conception of, of space of memory. So to, to answer that, your question on, on processes, and I'd like to share also like a couple of, of um, you know, it's more of a tool that I've made for myself. And, and it, it actually keeps developing this tension between memorial and, and monument. And again, I insist, this is something I created as a tool and that I often use when engaging with um, politicians who only have like five minutes, right? To understand why it is a bad idea to just make a monument and why we need to move towards the memorial. So um, so if we, we, if we hold like a, uh, apples and oranges sort of comparison, uh, where on the left we see characteristics of the monument and on the left of the memorial, uh, these are some of like the bullet points that I try to to constantly remind myself on when making a design decision. So on the monument side, you too often have uh, uh, situations where a memorial, and I'm just going to keep calling them generally memorial, but a memorial is speak, spoken about or designed in exclusive uh, processes where very few people uh, have the chance to to speak uh, in closed doors. So if we think of that as a, as one end of the spectrum, then the other one becomes the memorial would need to aspire to be designed in inclusive processes where a huge array and diversity of voices are, are heard and, and are allowed to, to speak. So that already, if we think about victims or those affected by violence as being part of the parties that need to be involved in a memorial process, then this is where, where I think I would um, place that, that uh, process aspect. Um, and similarly, what, what, what as you define, you know, monuments tend to be thought of as well. We we have uh, I don't know a bid, or, or we have a political desire to create a monument. We have a bid. Uh, there are certain characteristics so to make so that people become eligible. Uh, a winning proposal is chosen. It is built. The ribbon is cut. Boom, done. Right, and we just need to maintain or do upkeep on the, on the piece. Whereas I really think that that memorials are are actually undefined. You no, know, they they are permanent. They're, we should design them to be permanently changing. There is no such thing as cutting the ribbon and boom, that's it. We need to allow them to constantly evolve and and change and transform. And and the reason why we 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 could think about memorials being in constant flux is because we're actually focused rather than focused on a specific date, on specific names, on specific perpetrators in the past, we're actually thinking about violence as a, con as a contextual 
a, a, a you know space as something that that has a lot of different uh, connections to and we need to be attuned quite sensibly to all of these different nuances in the context and in place that allow us to to understand and what violence is being commemorated and how it can respond and i mean there are other characteristics that that i'll briefly mention like one very obvious one is that monuments really do tend to be monumental in scale you know in, in strictly architectural terms you know they need to be seen from afar they need to be impose a message upon spectators whereas memorials really should be about humans and the human scale is a design tool that allows us to tap into the privileging of people and their voices rather than the object uh, the architectural object as the conveyor of, of the message of the past there's also the notions of, of ownership and um, you know monuments there's too often we find especially last year you know, when monuments in, in the united states or here in mexico I, everywhere on the world monuments are being intervened by protesters and there's this question of ownership right well you don't own that they don't own that how dare these people uh, attack or, or you know whatever these, these spaces of memory or these objects of memory so there's this thing that they're not quite owned by anyone but they are owned by everyone and there's but the, the conception of a collective ownership really isn't at the heart of a monument whereas i think memorials we need to think of them as collectively owned um, and exercised and and yeah the, the monuments try to to and, and the material with which we which monuments are designed is about conveying a, a, a closed-ended uh, you know history that has been sanctioned that has been conceived as truth whereas a memorial what we what we want to do is allow them to be updatable that is to recognize that in 10 20 50 100 years our understanding of the event that is commemorated is not going to be the same so we need to unlock the design to be able to be to have a behavior that is unpredictable in the future. And finally, like monuments, they demand spectatorship. They demand uh, passive uh, stances, you know, to be to be almost uh, uh, adored in a way or worshipped. Whereas memorials, I think they're they're they should provoke us to to really transform them and touch them and participate and to 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 create organization, political organization. So these are just some of the, of the process um, compasses or compass that I use. And I will finish by saying is that actually like not all on the monument side is to be avoided and not all that is on the memorial side is to be uh, sought after. I've, I've, I've learned in, in the, especially as I keep going in, is that we need a bit of both. You know? and, and we need a bit of history. We need a bit of memory. Uh, we need to be able to hold the complexity of these two, uh, you know, opposites in the spectrum, uh, and and use them to the advantage of of, of what transitional justice pillars are are striving for. So this is uh, this is uh, really fascinating, and I'm I'm especially intrigued by your um, concept of memorials as as really having this performative. Um, you know, a, a certain kind of performative aspect which brings in a spectator, um, a spectator who might not themselves have been uh, directly involved in the violence, who might consider themselves as merely an onlooker, but um, through this, you know, a, 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 a conceptualization of memorials, not as something where a viewer is just passive, but as something where the viewer is brought in um, and given a space of you know sort of active act, act um, I don't know activity uh, participation that this is a means I think of um, of reconceptualizing um, um, what a memorial will can do uh, and what I'm there reminded of is your idea of memorials not just as restoring the dignity or the memories of uh, people who have suffered violence of the victims, but also as transformative, as aiming to transform not just the lives of the victims or their families, but the whole of society. Um, so that memorials, in effect, um, aim to act as that kind of bridge um, that um, um, provides a space of interaction for victims and society 
in order to sort of rebuild those connections, um, transform a victim into a citizen, you know, give back uh, to the victims their citizenship, their, their status as rights holders, as well as transform society. Um, you know, this is, this is the aspiration and how that gets articulated in the memorial, I think it's really, and in, in the process of making it, you know, is, is really fascinating. I wanted to ask you before we move on to the next uh, one, um, what was your, what was it like to work with the Mexican state there? <laughs> well, um, it hasn't been easy. Um, I think uh, I've, I've engaged, well, with the News Divine was my first uh, engagement with working for, or in collaboration, I would say, um, with um, an entity of the Mexican state. Uh, it was for the local Mexican city government, but it's important that I was, I was invited as an advocate as an expert, so to speak, that would advocate for the victims uh, of the news divine. And well, um, I mean, there's a lot to say. Um, I guess back then I was too focused in the news divine to on the memory and non-repetition aspects of the work. And I wasn't too in tune with the truth and justice elements, right? So uh, it, it also had to do with another, a lot of details and. Uh, conditions of in which I was working there. Um, I mean, I was 25 years old at the time, so it was a lot to learn, definitely. But I want to say that, for example, uh, at the end of the project, when we finished it and opened it to the public, and it started uh, operating, as I described earlier, I noticed that many of the families were, were um, dissatisfied with, with the lack of justice in, in, in the project. And um, I actually sometimes would think actively of, of, of of removing the justice aspect because it just seemed too hard uh, to go against the, the mechanics of impunity that are at work in Mexico. So in a way I didn't realize it, but by focusing too much on memory, I ended up uh, serving the, and, and with the memorial, I ended up serving this interest of the Mexican state of not indicting their own, uh, uh, you know, those responsible in their own ranks. Uh, to to effectively uh, help build those guarantees of non-repetition. So uh, today, for example, I think a lot about that when I engage with, with the state, is that if I am invited to work with the state, then I have to be very careful that what I'm working as an architect and with memory does not work in the long run against not just the interests of the, of the victims who are affected directly and who, who I'm working with, but also their communities and also in, in expanding uh, gradients of, of social fabrics. So to this, I also say that um, I will say no to the state nowadays more and more, but I will also say no to the victims because I, I really, it's a complex situation where I have to, sometimes I tell the state is like, you need me to be an ally of the, of the victims so that they are part of this process. Otherwise your process is a simulation. But similarly, I say to victims, you need me to be an ally of the state so that your, your desires find more opportunities to be voiced and, and, and acted upon within the state institutions. So it's, it's, it's a tricky place to be in. But unfortunately, at, I, in, you know, today, April 19, 2021, I have to say that uh, my experience with the Mexican state is, is getting worse and worse because I'm seeing how uh, more they've become more and more authoritative and using memory and memorial projects to construct their own state narrative uh, for political gain. And, and so my work has been, I think it is now in the process of shifting to be uh, working against the state, uh, just because that is what the pendulum swing demands right now. And my work is becoming more and more about uh, creating an awareness of how memory and memorials can actually become tools uh, that uh, work against victims, work against transitional justice, uh, uh, desires and work for authoritarian uh, regimes to to hold more power. Uh, and I mean, there's the case of the, the, the memorial to the victims of forced disappearance in Guerrero, which I began working on uh, almost three years ago with, and this was with the Mexican federal government. They invited me to design a, a, a process. And I mean, in very few words, after a few months of, of working with uh, the peasants who were uh, with peasants who were disappeared by the Mexican army in 1972, 
we realized that the only thing that was actually uh, being done was the memorial and that their own collective and individual reparation and other uh, elements of non-repetition, such as access to drinking water, you know, that, all of that was part of a reparational project. Those weren't happening. So we had to, decide, we had to open a space where we kind of self-sabotaged the memorial because we realized its potential for, for violence, for further violence down the road. So, and that's where the project is right now. So I, I kind of had to self-sabotage my own memorial uh, with, with an agreement with uh, victims and until uh, we, we would be given access to a complete integral holistic project that could actually aspire to non-repetition and reparation. That is really fascinating. <laughs> um, the, um, the tussles over um, contacts working with the state especially something like the Mexican state, I think are, are very, very, can be very difficult. I know from our position, from the Symbolic Reparations Research Project, um, our, we work in contexts that are judicial contexts within the, the inter-American uh, human rights system. And those must be, uh, the, the court mandates to the state. So you must work with the state. Um, but that is a, a, a real difficulty in so many cases. And I can see the, you know, the, the way in which that can prompt at, at on the one hand, sort of um, 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 ideas that uh, from the point of view of the victims of, of, yes, we can do this. Yes, there is movement forward, but then um, the deep frustration that can set in when those um, those paths forward are really uh, are stymied. Um, that is a, a, a very difficult situation. I was wondering if you had um, more, um, a few more images maybe of the Guerrero uh, situation, um, even though you self-sabotaged the memorial. Um, and then um, perhaps we can move from there into talking a little bit about your work with forensic architecture. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, I do have some, some images, um, not that many, because, I mean, it's important to say that most of the, I mean, what I have is, is, is this image of, of the context in where, where this, this town where the, the peasants live. It is a 900 inhabitants, tiny town in, in rural Guerrero, the south of Mexico, where, uh, you know, during the 1960s and 70s, which is when this, this event happened, there was a radical push for a different form of politics in which peasants wanted to self-determine and free themselves from, from um, I don't know, the control, the economical control and the political control that they were subjected to in terms of not being able to sustain their own families and also not having options to different political representations. And this is a place where, where fundamentally basketball is played. So this is a, an image of, of the town. And actually that house that we see in the back, I mean, I'm sorry, this is all like a silhouette, but that house in the back used to be a school and that is where the, the, the peasants were first tied down and were first uh, tortured before being taken to before being disappeared and taken to army barracks. Um, and what we what what this very event speaks of is a, a an event that is not that well known even to Mexicans. This period in the end of the fifties, from 1958 to 1984, uh, where that we call the Dirty War, or almost exactly like the Dirty Wars of Latin America, uh, uh, in which not quite a di dictatorship in Mexico, but some somehow the um, control of politics and economy uh, instigated a lot of people in different parts of the country to rebel and ask for, for more democratic uh, institutions and representation. And in a similar way, as, as, I, as I mentioned, that uh, we, 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 till this day, this memorial uh, also takes a little bit that formula that I introduced with the news divining, which we commemorate a past where 90, more than 90 people were disappeared. But we see that today, this, this, this phenomenon of forced disappearance, especially in that part of Mexico, pervades till this day. So we need to recognize that the, the potential for forced disappearance is latent. And therefore, we need to create a, a space where the community can strengthen the, the capacities that 
made them vulnerable in the first place almost 50 years ago to this this forced disappearance and that has to do with economical uh, self-determination and the, the ability to be, create their own political and educational systems so i just want to mention briefly and again I, I'm, I'm sorry i don't have that much images um i could show them in a little bit in a few minutes um, but the idea of this 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 architecture this memorial was to be uh, built up with four different components one being an actual architectural space scholarly research that would create uh, uh, would really go into the archives and and dig up the history that precedes this this event of violence and that would explain what happened in 1972 and what is ongoing today so it's a book uh, 200 and so page book that we produced that is divided into these three chapters, past, present, and future. And the documentary that would would, would um, register the entire process and you know digital tools that could be, be able to, to tell the story to all of Mexico. But I want to go to, um, I mean, this is a, a version from a long time ago, but this is more or less a Gantt chart or, or my role was to coordinate these four different components and make them come together. And the reason why I don't have that many images, Robin, is because we stopped our process. We finished, uh, you must have seen some images of us holding workshops with the peasants. Um, and I can show them if I dig them up in my website quickly. But the reason why I don't like to show those images either is because they, I've seen, for example, the government use them as, uh, as ways to justify that this project is ongoing when in fact it stopped. Um, so we never really, before we got to the point of designing the architectural space that was the memorial, we, we stopped ourselves. And this is why <laughs> I should have put them in my presentation, but um, this is why I don't readily um, share them because I've seen how they've been used to basically to lie. But all right, just quickly, I just opened my, my website. Like for example, like this is more documentation of the actual victims playing in context, uh, you know, participatory mapping that we've done. Uh, I mean, they 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 take a lot of pride into their basketball skills because they've been champ like area like champions uh, for for a long time. They're known to be very good. Workshops we feel we made with uh, with the children where we understand what their conception of the dirty war is. Uh, sadly, the newer generations are not at all aware that their grandparents and great grandparents suffered this violence, and also like. You know, studying with ethnography, like the the community dynamics that are that work today to like upkeep the the public spaces in the town, and these are some of the workshops images that we did with the children, and um, and for example, like one day we arrived and and we saw this this text that was on the wall of the space where we reunite, and they they are you know making demands of of being heard, and. And these are some of the, the plenary sessions. And as you can see, most of the people who are on the, uh, you know, represent are, are the surviving direct victims are, you know, adult seniors, in, uh, male that, uh, you know, survive and are, are, they're quite old that they're getting sick. So what I also support their decision in stopping the project is because they have very little time left before they pass. Uh, and it's quite possible that they will pass without seeing justice, uh, truth, reparation, and non-repetition, much less their memorial. Mm -hmm. So that's so so uh, um, so yeah. you 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 collectively stopped the the memorial as as itself a kind of um, process of um, through which the the victims could. Um, uh, not give over complete control to the to the state, um, but um, so so I, I think this is this this is a really interesting kind of example of 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 um, I don't know whether you would call it a failed process, but um, one in which the 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 state has still managed to dominate the narrative. I don't know if I would call it a failed. I mean. I still communicate with the victims twice a month. Uh -huh. And there are other more technical uh, challenges that we need to overcome. For example, this, this, this project was commissioned by the executive commission, a federal agency that's there, uh, that is tasked to repair victims in Mexico. It's called the Executive Commission for the Attention to Victims. And uh, this, this institution has been uh, leaderless for two years. Uh, so the, the the commissioner who I was who, who 
who commissioned me <laughs> to do this. Uh, he resigned four months after we started. Then for six months, there was no commissioner. Then a new commissioner came and she resigned like four months after. So what I'm seeing is also a very purpose. My diagnosis is that the Mexican state or the, the executive power, the, exec, the federal executive power of Mexico is working, putting a lot of resources into undermining the very fragile and very young mechanisms and institutions we have created in Mexico to tend to victims. So, bef so that is what, what I think about in terms of this project is that it should, I would like it to be conceived more rather than a failure as, an, as a case study of, of how dire we need to really work from law and, and re, restructure these institutions and, and initiatives from the ground up, from law, so that they can, by the time they become a project where they, uh, you know, when someone like me engages, there are actual conditions to be able to carry these out. And so I would say that that project was doomed from the start because that foundation is, is very fragile. So I think it should be seen as one example of why we actually need to work even at a lower level, no? And, and, that, and I can't really work from that level. All I can say is, is, is share my, my experience and because it's actually lawmakers and lawyers who, who, who need to be called upon to, to help redesign these, these institutions and laws so, and programs, yeah. There's obviously a lot of work to be done. Um, in lots of directions. Um, perhaps we can uh, turn from this to your work with forensic architecture um, for a few minutes and then open up to questions um, from, from the audience. So tell me, tell us about how you came across forensic architecture, how, um, you know, what is your experience of the methodologies of forensic architecture? And then um, let's we can talk more about their methodologies in relation to these concepts of memory and truth. Um, that's a really good. I, I, I want to get to that. But um, first, how did I get to Faye? Um, well, it was entirely. I mean, I guess I mentioned at the beginning of, of uh, when I was explaining, like, how did I began doing memorials and memory and all of this thing? Was that a? Uh, I mean, I was. I was essentially thinking about what is architectural and architect's role in, in, in facilitating pro peace building processes. And I mentioned that there's, there's been two answers that I found. And from 2011 to 2017, I mostly focused on one path, which is through memory and memorials. But something happened in 2017 that uh, actually made me realize that there, were, there was also another path and I hope to find even a third path or fourth in the future. And the second path is through forensics and counter forensic investigation. What, I mean, I had, but in September, 2017, and some of you may or may not know, but there were a series of, a lot of things happened that month in, in September, 2017. One of them was huge earthquakes in Mexico City. But another is that um, an ex, there was a case of forced disappearance that is a, very, very important for the recent history of Mexico, in where in September 2014, 43 students from a rural school were disappeared. And it became a very, uh, there were a lot of, like, there were dozens and dozens of marches, many of which I participated, demanding these students to be presented alive as they were taken. Um, fast forward to 2017, this very complex case of human right, of, of terrible human rights violations was picked up by forensic architecture. And for, for those of you, of you who don't know what FA is, FA is a research agency, a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary research agency that is based in Goldsmiths, University of London, uh, that gathers filmmakers, architects, artists, uh, lawyers, scientists, like it is radically tra uh, transdisciplinary and together, we look at cases of human rights violations and use our own disciplines to see different perspectives on, 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 on an event and complement them all to create a different narrative. And we use a, a lot of technology and audiovisual and media tools and media analysis to be able to, to narrate these. And FA, I use FA and forensic architecture interchangeably, FA was tasked uh, to look into this case of the, for, of the disappeared students of Ayotzinapa. And they presented 
their findings in an art, in a contemporary art museum, I would argue Mexico's most important contemporary art museum uh, in September, 2017. And I went to this, to this exhibit. And I mean, I walked out a changed architect. I had known FA's work for a while, mostly their work on, on uh, you know, uh, settler colonialism in occupied territories um, and assassinations of certain activists. But suddenly seeing FA's methodology so close to home and a case that I thought I knew well, but seeing how their work provided an extraordinary amount of, of clarity and detail on what happened that night made me realize that I wanted to go there. I wanted to, to, to study what FA did at Goldsmiths. I wanted to work with them. So that's, that basically was the beginning of a, a, of a process where I applied and I actually wrote to the, to the director of FA directly and told him like, hey, can I work for you? <laughs> and um, thankfully I was able to go to London, study the masters at, at Goldsmiths on, on research architecture. And, and, I've, and I've been working with FA as a collaborator for more than a year, officially as an employee and, and part of their you know, research team since September, 2020. And I mean, it's been, it's been fantastic because I mentioned earlier that with the News Divine Memorial, I wasn't paying attention to the truth and justice components. But through forensics, I've realized that um, these five pillars of, of, of transitional justice, the, the counter forensics uh, methods and, and, and theories are especially useful when trying to elucidate truth and to uh, instigate processes of, of justice, per, uh, of generation of justice. And then the memory and memorials aspect is, is particularly effective for or pr productive for non-repetition and reparation. And, and what I've, my current, I, as I, I can't really speak too much about what I'm doing right now at FA, because they need to, these investigations need to be published. But these, these concepts of truth and memory have, uh, have found new expressions. And using memory as a way to also understand the event of violence itself, not just how to work with it on the present and the future, but using um, you know, new, new dimensions that I really didn't think about years ago have opened up. Like for example, understanding environmental violence and how it connects to, to racial injustices and how it connects to, to events such as the disappearance of, of the Ayotzinapa students and thinking about the memory of the earth and thinking about the memory uh, you know, in, in much more broader uh, terms. So working at FA has really given me a lot of tools to be able to tangibly work, not just at a conceptual, but actually tangibly work with, with, uh, with space and with spatial politics. And, and what I'm doing now in Mexico is that I'm trying to put these to, uh, to work. Like I, I'm, I'm offering these, these methods and, and methodologies to uh, the local prosecutor's office in Mexico City so that we can try to um, you know, prosecute uh, events of human rights violations. So and we'll see. <laughs> it's, it's really exciting work. I think forensic architecture is, uh, and your work with them um, is, um, really just stunning. Um, the, the kinds of, of approaches and understandings of violence that forensic architecture manages to open up that um, we have not seen before. Um, I'd like to um, you know, sort of open up to questions from the audience now um, and maybe ask Michael Orwitz um, to come back. <laughs> And um, um, start off the, the the question the question period. Okay. okay, I'm here. I'm here. I've been here all along. Now, okay, my, I have a quick question. Actually, one of the things you mentioned is that um, memorials should be designed to be permanently changing. Okay, and it's the people that make the memorial. And one of the things that the symbolic reparations research. Um, project, one of the things that we in our guidelines have framed was the idea that that the monuments, the memorial should be should be constant, should be a constant renovation of meaning. In other words, as generations change, as conditions change, it should be able to accommodate and prompt, you know, new kinds of interpretations and new kinds of interventions. And I was wondering how what how would you design 
the physical a physical structure that would enable that kind of dialogue and openness and perhaps also even envision a moment when it's no longer significant or meaningful that it you know that it doesn't really uh, meet the the demands it's a great question michael um i guess what a lot of people immediately start to think about the architectural materials and uh spatial arrangements that allow for flexibility to be like part of a design in terms of like, you know, partitioning and allowing partition spaces to, to like come together or materials that, you know, the more obvious material is a, the electronic screen, like a screen and, and to build with screens and like use, use um, you know, these sorts of architectural uh, qualities to be able to, to speak about transformation, continuous transformation. And I, I used to think a lot about these. I still kind of do, but I've, I've since thought that um, the focus should rather be on designing emptiness. I mean, I think the best way to allow something new to come is by not placing anything. Uh, so really a lot of, of, of what I use as a design technique is uh, designing the, as little as possible and understanding that my role as a designer, as an architect is limited or my understanding of an event in the past as an architect is very limited. And therefore, I, the way I respond to knowing myself limited is by designing the least as possible and designing more the process that allows this, this uh, space to arise and just making sure that, uh, that we don't design elements or, or that those participating in the process don't try to put in elements that lock the, the, the space of memory into a specific time. In, in, and as an example, in the News Divine project, the, the parents more than once asked me like, hey, where's, where's the, um, you know, my child's picture going to be? Um, in, in a way they were asking me, where, where, where is the altar to my kid going to be so that I can put, put flowers to them? And, and, uh, and even adding like crosses, you know, Mexico is a deeply Catholic, uh, still deeply Catholic uh, place. And my response was really hard to say, but I told him like, we're, we're not going to, there isn't going to be a place. And um, we need to recognize that, that your children's experience is an entry point so that today and tomorrow, others might relate to their experience of violence. But um, we really can, the less we foreground the particularities of, of, of or, or I would say, um, I wanna say I find a better word than particularities, more like the isolated particularities of, of their lives, uh, the more we can speak to, to those who are in the future. But it's important also I found that we cannot entirely lose um, anchoring ourselves in a historical account uh, of what happened. And because if, if we open too much memorials to becoming these spaces of, of continuous interpretation, something like Eisenman's memorial in, in Berlin comes up in which everyone has an extremely subjective, abstract interpretation of the space. And, and so much so, that inevitably, you know, the German uh, parliament had to build a museum be beneath it to be able to say like, well, this is actually what it all means. So it ends up being like neither the abstract expression nor the monument, but both and at the same time, not really allowing us to unlock newer present interpretations of discrimination that can become genocidal. Um, and that is why like one of my main critiques of Eisenman's memorial is that, well, what did that memorial say when Khalid Yozgat was murdered years ago, you know, a Muslim man in, in the south of, of, of uh, Germany by, by this extreme right group, NSU. What did uh, you know, that space respond when you know, Alternative für Deutschland, this right-wing party uh, whose power seems to be dwindling, uh, started gaining power? So that's, I think that's where we really do need to anchor and hold both memory and history in, in our spaces of, of memory. Um, but yeah, in essence, I think what we need is just empty space. And I think that's the best design approach to, to, to allowing these spaces of memory to respond. And, and, I, and I would say, I would, I would just add by saying empty space framed and delimited by his history. Like this is what brings, what delimitates our space as, an, as a very architectural way of thinking of space. Like, we have in the news behind the walls, which are the past, and they always remind us why we are here, but we can choose to put that, like to not think about that 
and focus on the activity that is at present. So, um, we've got a question from Anjani Mayer um, here. It says, hello, Sergio. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us and share some of your work. I've been looking at your CV COVID-19 memorial on your website and it's fascinating. I love the idea of creating a space for the public to share their experience and what they went through during such a trying time for the world. How did you come up with the idea to design this digital memorial? Thanks, Anjani. Um, it'd be great to see you and respond directly to you. But um, so I have to say that um, one of the things I kind of mentioned but then is that the memorials I've worked on are, a lot of them are, are, are experiments. Not all of them take this, the shape of an architectural space that is built. Some of them are campaigns. Some of them are ephemeral objects in, in public space. And also I think of uh, memorials, if we think of memorials of spaces of memory, then I would, I like to extend space to its most uh, general terms, you know, institutional spaces, juridical spaces, uh, uh, like memorials can be all of these, you know, any kind of virtual space as well. And the, <laughs> for better or worse, every time something terrible happened, um, I inevitably start thinking of it in terms of what a memorial to, to this could look like. And when the pandemic uh, became, focused into view, which happened, uh, I guess, at the end of February of last year and, and early March, I, in, I started thinking about what a memorial to this pandemic could be. But a lot of it was not just creating a list because I knew that, you know, it would be a matter of days before we started seeing uh, newspapers or artists creating lists of names uh, and so on. Like we've all seen different responses to how can we remember the, the pandemic dead. But what I was really interested was in how can we visibilize the memory of those we are losing in such a way that they can mobilize action to, to mitigate the effects of the pandemic because this is going to be ongoing for months. And a year later, we're still doing it. So one thing I want to say is the CU19 Memorial was an experiment. Um, it is the, the breadth and the scale of the pandemic was such that we really, the team with which we worked on and we, we came together to work on this memorial from people from four different countries working remotely, uh, software designers, programmers, uh, communication experts, architects, etc. We all um, realized it was just too much for us to handle. So it's a project that um, you know lives in the internet, but it's we don't actively participate in it any longer. But what we did want to do is um, to create a memorial that could visualize the very individual stories of each person that was lost, but also connect their different experiences in such a way that we could foreground the commonalities and that those commonalities could be uh, you know, used as an archive for artists, lawmakers, et cetera, to mobilize into action. Um, and thankfully that has happened. I think that has happened. So, uh, yeah. Um, that's really um, fascinating. <laughs> and it, it, it a little bit, not much, but a little bit feeds into the next question, which I think we'll have to make our last question before we wrap up. Um, this one is about the Anti Monumento. Um, and this is from Adriana Miramontes, who says, Hello, Sergio, thank you for your wonderful presentation. <laughs> um, and um, could you tell us more about the Anti Monument and how your definition of the memorial is both a conversation with it and in opposition to it? I'm thinking, of course, about the anti monumentos to the 43 disappeared from Ayotzinapa and also to the Mexican feminists. Thanks, Adriana. That's a great, um, that's a great, great question. And I'm still, I'm still answering it. It's been like three years since I've, I've been asking myself, like, where does the, the anti monument um, uh, find itself you know, in this you know, ecosystem, growing ecosystem of spaces of memory? For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Mexico City has a, a very touristic uh, and in, historically important avenue called the Reforma. Um, it's very, it, call it the Champs Elysees of, of Mexico City. Um, and uh, it has been the custom of, of the Mexican state and the, the many regimes to place their own monuments on this, on this avenue. I sometimes think of them as pearls on, on, on a, ne a necklace of, of history. And the, in this corridor of monuments, 
uh, that have been mostly you know, placed by power, structures of power. M uh, victims of human rights violations in Mexico have begun to place their own monuments. Uh, and they almost all take the same aesthetic form, which are uh, uh, sculptural, uh, metallic sculptural elements that, and there, last time I counted them, there were nine. And they, the way I think of them as anti-monuments is because they don't, because they are placed by victims without permission of the state, um, then that is where the anti uh, is mostly placed, in my opinion. Uh, I've told you, Robin, uh, that I've been meaning to write a paper on, on anti-monuments for two or three years, but it is such a sensitive subject because I do aim to critique mon anti-monuments because I, I believe they are more on the monument side of the spectrum. Why? Because they, are, they tend to be self-enclosed and they speak about their own, the people who place them seem to, to, to address their own tragedies or their own uh, events of human rights violations. And I, I don't think they are open enough to allow other people who have experienced the same uh, violences to engage with and, and modify the, the, the anti-monuments so that they can be included, their own stories can be included. Now, this is of course, you know, it depends on each anti-monument. Here, Adriana, you, me, you mentioned uh, two anti-monuments. One is to the 43 students, disappeared students of Ayotzinapa, which, um, I mean, I would show an image, but um, basically it's, an, it's a monumental number that is made of steel, that's 43, and it has a plus sign. That plus sign aims to speak to those, those victims of forced disappearance that are almost 80,000 in Mexico by, by now. Um, but there is a specific story where the, a feminist pro protest uh, wrote on this monument that they, were not in, they didn't feel represented by this anti-monument. And the next day it was painted over. So I think this speaks a lot about competitive memory and how uh, you know, these anti-monuments uh, feel like they, they are produced in a way that is self-enclosed uh, in their efforts to, to be in opposition to the government they are conceived as these like secret projects and not unfortunately what is lost in that process is their capacity to dialogue with victims of other parts of the country that have also suffered those violences. The, and, but, but <laughs> for example, the anti-monument uh, placed by feminists, I don't think it's quite like that because I've seen how that anti-monument has become a space for organization of protests, of feminist protests. And since they don't name a particular victim, a particular woman that was killed because of, for gender related reasons, uh, a lot of like, women are feel represented and included in that anti-monument. And uh, feminists often will, will uh, take care of and, and, vig and be vigilant at, uh, of that space. So it's become appropriate, it's become collectively owned, it's a space of organization, it's a space of reflection, of action. And that, that swings a little bit more towards the memorial side of the spectrum. And that's something that I would really like anti-monuments to be more about, is about organization and uh, dialogue and joining different experiences of violence, rather than just thinking about what happened on the 26th of September, 2014, where 43 students were disappeared. So, I think we're, we're, we're sort of run, I mean, we have run out of time, unfortunately, um, because this has been a really fascinating uh, conversation with you, Sergio. Um, so we have um, a couple more questions, um, but I think we'll have to sort of answer those um, um, offline um, because um, some of our audience needs to leave and we're going to run out of time. So I'll say thank you very much um, for joining us for this wonderful conversation. And we really look forward to working with you, seeing you again, and to seeing what you do in the future. So thank you everyone for- Thank you very much, this is brilliant. Yeah, and- um, everyone who's, who's here. And we'll see you all again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everyone else.